uh, what we'll do is we'll have both the other speakers uh, share their views first before we open it up uh, to the uh, group here f for asking questions. So I'll ask Mr. Pradeep uh, to answer. And uh, I think the tracker question still didn't get answered. So if you have your thoughts on uh, solar trackers and do you feel that that's another way of increase, uh, improving the uh, generation while uh, not impacting the uh, ONM. Thank you, Monica. So I have a small time to speak and then my colleague has to take up. So I will uh, give my ideas on the operation maintenance practices and the technology that we can adopt and some of the uh, guarantee warranty issues which solar plant generally observe after a few years of life. So I came from a distribution company uh, background in initial years of uh, my career and then almost like 10 years in uh, solar now. So I see there are some disconnect between uh, solar plant design and the basic technology available within uh, power sector in India. Of course, we have not many uh, multinational companies, multinational products or <coughs> the automation technology which has been adopted in power sector for long, which are being existing and thermal plants, transmission system, distribution system are they are much ahead of adopting those technologies. Uh, let me start with the SCADA. So SCADA uh, uh, systems are being uh, used in distribution, transmission and generation on a widely, uh, very wide scale. What we see, the design offered by uh, the supplier, the EPC companies and, and what is being uh, Envisaged by the designers or, or, or the technical guys is a very trimmed down version of SCADA. So the SCADA which we are using in solar plants now is basically supervised part of it and the data acquisition. SCADA itself means supervised controlled data acquisition. So control part we are not using it. What we have seen, in fact, I have been into operation maintenance, uh, project development, execution, design, business development, all uh, areas of the solar business. <clears throat> what we I have observed is the medium voltage devices, the low voltage devices, including inverter, RMUs, the breakers, which we have been using solar, they are all automated devices available. All the breakers are motorized. The SCADA is any technology supplier which are offering to you, they offer with all the parameters to all the distribution, transmission companies, generation companies with all the parameters wherein you can remotely operate and control your equipment inside plant from a remote controlled location. I'll give you an example. I was working with a distribution company almost 12 years uh, in Delhi, Tata Power. In Tata Power Delhi distribution company, we are operating all our medium voltage substations, even uh, the lower part also, uh, 11 kV also, 33, 11, 66, even higher voltage, EHVs, all unmanned substations. There is not a single person in the substation to do any operation locally. Not even the security guard. All are locked. So when, whenever there is a maintenance required, so there is a permit to work system. In solar, we do not follow. It is a basic guidelines as per the electricity rules that you have to obtain a permit to work from an authorized officer or authorized executive. So all our uh, solar plant engineers, they are operating uh, their devices, inverter, transformer, breaker, or any other devices without any permit to work system, any time of the day, any time of the night. So what I mean to say is if we use the full scale SCADA, 
with automated control, use all the devices properly, integrate them. Now we have very good connectivity even to the remoter sites also. Previously, the, there was a challenge in getting the connectivity. So now you can integrate all your devices and the entire plant to a centralized SCADA system where it, wherein you can configure your device to be remotely operate. And you can have control that your OM operator or, uh, or very junior site engineer will not operate the device as and when he feels or as and when it is demanded at the site without any planning. So that will give you a very good descent of time. Another uh, missing part in solar which we are not adopting is hotline maintenance. Advanced utilities in India also, uh, I've seen many uh, utilities which are in other countries, they are doing hotline maintenance for even for low voltage, 11 kV, 33 or even HV, EHVs. With trained staff, with uh, right kind of PP, with right kind of devices. This is one which is missing. A lot of uh, uh, hotline maintenance practices are being used uh, by transmission company in India, of course. I don't know whether how many people know, PGCL is doing hotline maintenance for very long. So this is one area where we can explore and it is not that technology is not accessible, it is accessible. Then uh, I want to focus something on cluster based maintenance which Monica for, uh, uh, gave a brief. So cluster based maintenance, uh, since now you have a lot of uh, assets around near by the solar parks nearby uh, good uh, areas where we have a lot of uh, uh, solar access by multiple developers. This is one area which is being ignored for so long and we are using all the um, local practices, hiring local engineers which are very very unskilled. Coming days India is growing at a faster pace and we might not be able to hold a BTEC engineer guy who is sitting at site for very long. So uh, this is one area uh, we have to explore and cluster based maintenance is being done by many other, uh, many other utilities, many other uh, uh, areas. The third point which uh, I want to mention here is that about the warranty claims of the modules. So every module manufacturer give you uh, warranty terms, what is the degradation, which is acceptable. However, the contracts are not having sufficient clauses and the process which is mutually agreed with the module manufacturer, how do you claim? What is the claim process to be adopted between the part buyer and the seller, which are the labs you would approach which is acceptable to both the parties. And what is the sample size going to be? So um, I'll give you an example, I recently uh, happened to be in my headquarters in Spain and we, I, I was interacting to one, my, one of my uh, O&M team uh, head, uh, the O&M team head is responsible for about 1.8 gigawatt assets which we have developed globally and they have been able to claim almost like 0.1 percent of the modules from the module manufacturer globally. They have been able to get either the module or the money after five years, seven years or ten years because they focus very very rigorously on the claim process when we sign up the contract for the module procurement and what is the what is the accepted degradation level and and how do you how do you approach to the buyer or to the to the seller uh, coming on to that tracker uh, i have seen um, trackers being used by my company in various part of the globe and cheru 
Chile, Peru, Regua, Spain, multiple locations. Uh, of course, India is uh, now a bigger market than those markets. So Tracker are being uh, used for my company for about 10, 10 11 years now, single axis and dual axis. So there are uh, advantages uh, with respect to the locations. Uh, some location might not be suitable. So it's a call, but yes, they, uh, there are there are demonstration of the gain. However, uh, the problem here in India is any tracker manufacturer or the supplier, uh, they uh, generally uh, give you some differential, but the data, sufficient data is not being captured by themselves. So let's say there are uh, there are uh, manufacturers who have done about 10, 15 megawatt or 20 megawatt site. So uh, what they what they are lacking is they are not capturing uh, the radiation on the horizontal plane. They are comparing with the inclined plane. So uh, it is very difficult for any investor or a developer to you know accept those uh, those uh, gains when you don't have uh, sufficient uh, data captured with respect to your particular site or with respect to your uh, particular installation my suggestion to 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 the tracker companies would be to to actually uh, put in place the measurement documents and capture at least one year two year data to demonstrate uh, to the developers for them to take a uh, judgmental call on the investment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep, and thank you for the suggestion. Um, I see few folks who are connected to the tracker here in the room, so I'm pretty sure that they will take back your suggestion uh, on the same. Um, I'll open it up to Shalendra to share his thoughts. No, no, uh, it would be better if you be seated here. Um, Shalendra, a lot of topics have already been covered, so it's actually hard to be at the end. Uh, but I would urge uh, if you can probably uh, share a little more thoughts on upcoming technologies maybe, uh, as well as how do you do, uh, specifically when a developer is looking at buying existing assets, uh, what are some of the key criteria that they look from an O&M perspective uh, before making that decision. Nevertheless, I represent IBC Solar. IBC is a German solar company which has been in existence for a little more than three decades. Perhaps the oldest surviving solar company in the world. And uh, we have done globally around 3.7 gigawatts, comprising of both rooftop as well as large scale systems. In India, we have been here in this market for last three and a half years. And uh, as of now, we have done around 80 megawatts of EPC for large projects. I mean, uh, large not in the Indian context that we have today, but it comprises of six projects in three different states. Uh, then in 2016 onwards, we have started our own development as well. And uh, right now, we participated in tenders and we won a project. We are setting up a 27 megawatt in Odisha. The project is going to get commissioned maybe in the next couple of weeks. And uh, from an O&M side, as a company, we do O&M for all our projects which for which we have done the EPC. So we are doing O&M technically for 80 megawatts today. So all in all, it's a more of an integrated platform that we have uh, here in India wherein we do development, EPC as well as O&M. Uh, now coming back to the issue of uh, you know uh, before I go into the other topics, you know today for us when when I'm a developer I was, uh, as well as the EPC contract and the O and M when I look at the business from this side, I mean the pie is the cake, size of the cake is same you know we know what the size of the cake. Once you have a tariff which has been agreed for 25 years, you know the insurance cost and. Uh, the cost of financing or your cost of capital, then what is left for EPC and O&M is a fixed buy. And now that has to be divided in a prudent way so that you meet both your financing requirements in terms of the execution of the project from an EPC perspective as well as leave a little pie for the O&M guys as well to take it for the next 25 years. Now ch the challenge before us as I do 80 megawatts of projects is that today o and is a low value business, it's a low value business because 
for example, for a company like us, which which has got limited bandwidth, managing six projects O and M, I don't know. I mean, if you make a eight ten percent margin on the overall top line, it really doesn't add to your <laughs> uh, whole business sense. And so, so maybe this is the time. Maybe a specialized O and M companies, or what Monica was referring to, they come in. But having said that, uh, the problem remains the same. Because in that case, I'll transfer my problem that we have today, a low margin business, to Monica. Now, how does she handle it? So effectively, that's where the, the industry has to take a note of it, in the sense that how do you incentivize how these o &M contractors, be it the contracting party or the subcontractor, who is the cleaning the modules or who is doing the everyday job, how do you, how do you, you know, incentivize them to keep the interest intact in this project, in this activity for a longer period of time? And that's one of the bigger challenges that we face. Uh, in terms of, uh, and uh, second issue is that are we really, uh, really accounting for the risk that we're taking? For example, some of the participants spoke about generation-based guarantees, strict, you know, contracts enforcing PR. It's all fine. I mean, uh, we can have best of the lawyers and the best of the technical minds, which is available in this room to work on a contract which is acceptable to both parties. But question is when you put a price of say, what, five lakhs or maybe seven lakhs per annum, and if I really uh, do a prudent accounting as per the international gap, then actually I'm making a loss, you know. The question is, again, it comes back to the pricing part of it. So it's, it's, so it's a combination that, uh, of course, what is the kind of equipments that we decide decide to buy? Uh, there's a lot of focus on modules, you know. But question is, uh, as far as uh, I mean, I spent 20 years in this industry, 10 years in wind, 10 years in solar, both on the manufacturing side as well. I think, as far as the module is concerned, it's more of a like a airbag in your car that once it is fitted, then you get to know the problems when you meet with the accident. Uh, you know, so so right from the beginning, you need to specify what the BOM is, what is the what is what it goes into the module manufacturing. Then you are maybe assured about the quality. And my experience, I mean, we have done that in wind as well. These kind of generation guarantees, which were given by companies like Enercons and Suzlons of the world. I mean, at the end of the day, if you ask the developers 20 years, 15 years down the line, how many of them have really been able to enforce those things? You know, it really doesn't work. So please, let's not fool ourselves with saying that, OK, we'll have great contracts to structure around it. Basically, we need to create a commercial interest, which is viable for the o &M contractor and the EPC contractor, so that they have interest in this business. That's the, that's the biggest challenge that we have. And that's the challenge that I am facing for my business if I talk about o &M. So that being the case, I think uh, we are moving through interesting times. Um, the whole energy scenario is changing. And uh, coming back to your question, what we look at, I think uh, if uh, for acqu acquisition of assets, I think, uh, the, I mean, most of the assets have not passed through a considerable phase, like 10, 12 years. So it's relatively new assets. So right now, most of the focus is on the quality of equipments that has been used, or the kind of designing that has been used. And as far as the o &M is concerned, you know, for our customers who, I mean, maybe a CEO of a company calls me saying, okay, my north side mein panch module bada ganda lag raha hai. I go, okay, fair enough, but that should not be the focus. You know, module cleaning is one part of it. There are a whole bunch of things which goes into it that also need to be looked at for a longer term performance. I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Shalind. I was very happy to hear the numbers like 5 lakhs and 7 lakhs because if that's the number that per megawatt peak our O&M contractor would be getting today, they would be more than happy to jump into this business. Um, so, <laughs> with that... <laughs> we just wanted to make you happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. So, 5 or 7 lakhs is what we are talking about. Um, every 2 megawatt. Every 2 megawatt. <laughs> that's a closer number. Um, I do agree with what Shalendra said that uh, the kind of margin pressures that developers have, uh, be it during the construction as well as during the ONM phase, the margins are definitely squeezing quite a bit. Um, and it is becoming more a volume game than a margin percentage game, which is where some of the specialized 
partners um, i mean if you would see mahindra sustain in when we started we uh, were looking at only doing onm for our own epc portfolio but we realized this need and we kind of opened up to the third party onm uh, just so that we are able to take advantages of this uh, uh, volume now with this uh, i will open the panel discussion for questions from the audience if you have some specific questions uh, we would be happy to answer How would Mahindra address that? Would you have a dewatering pump at site? I'm sure we don't do that for every site, right? Am I audible? Yeah. This again boils down to like what he said, the quality implementation of the project stage itself. Uh, you already know the terrain, you already know what the is and the geographical scope, the uh, landscaping part of it or I would say the slope. Why don't we have it inbuilt at the stage itself? It has, it, it's, a, it's a known fact, but then we are waiting for the next cycle of you know the monsoons to come and then learn the hard way. We would be doing it at ultimately, but then if you can do it proactively, that would be better. The photograph that you are referring to I think is a hailstorm in Rajasthan, but of course it holds good for even the uh, floods and storms, wherein if you have an inverter, Let's say uh, I'm talking about this uh, string inverter. Where the heights are low. The water would flood, and you get to get. To, they are damaged. It is happening, despite the fact that it has been already warned. Like somebody rightly pointed out, the project uh, personnel they are in a hurry to get out of the thing. Just hand it over to one and go to next project, not realizing the fact that it is. I'm only transferring my monkey to his shoulder. But then uh, I think one of the other good method would be to nominate a voluntary. Uh, volunteers in the project team who are good competents, who are good professionals and tell them beforehand, look, uh, would you be interested in ONM as well? So if he proposes, let's say, if I were the project director, uh, project uh, leader, and if I in, uh, opt for, let's say, ONM as well, then my outlook itself changes. The whole perspective is, I'm looking at it different. So, uh, but however, it, it is the fact that project people is the time which matters, it's not the money. But when it comes to ONM, it is money, not the time. So there is a paradigm. I mean, it's a dilemma. Uh, thank you, Mr. Reddy. Okay, I one minute. Yeah. <coughs> that solar power is required for everybody, every individual. But it is not yet attracted oh, by the church. common people. What is the reason you think? The, it is required every house. And what is happening? People are making the solar park, and they are giving this, uh, that power to everybody. Issue in terms of this, it should be developed where it is required. There, there are different approach to the urban. What is the reason for that? I got my point. The the beauty of solar is that uh, you can generate where you want, okay? And uh, for that to happen, you need to have the policies uh, which are conducive for that. And uh, the the government of India looked at uh, 100 gigawatt in the form of 60 gigawatt for, uh, uh, you know, rooftop or 60 gigawatt for on-grid, which is centralized power plant and then transmit through a uh, transmission system or through the rooftop systems of 40 gigawatt. Rooftop is nothing but you are generating where you want. Okay, so they have seen that there is an issue in that uh, deployment. There are issues. Some of the discounts are not encouraging. Policies of the states are not okay. And they are giving, um, uh, there were a lot of, um, you know, ideas being thought through where uh, the subsidy directly going to the user, whether there could be uh, uh, through another account or there could be a reduction in income tax. Now, there's, but the happenings in solar is so fast the policy what is done uh, maybe a month back becoming uh, has to be revisited maybe after three months four months like that so i think it is evolving there are programs in uh, place but i agree with you that it's not yet uh, you know so popular that every individual can uh, uh, do on its own uh, but it is evolving i think at, at present today i think uh, the government is uh, taking a step back how we can uh, enhance the distributed generation and the rooftop system uh, policies are changing and evolving um, i think one thing that i want to add here is 
there's also a shift uh, specifically if you look at uh, the metros right if you if i if i'm talking about the ncr region there are people who have money to afford putting a solar rooftop but they don't have the terrace right uh, you are looking at people who are living in apartments and so there is no basically free space for them to put their solar plant on i do know there are business models there are companies who are looking at an opex based version where they would be leasing out terraces of not just the apartment buildings but probably schools hospitals and the users who have big pockets who can basically afford that uh, afford putting up of the plant they would match these along with the terraces so there are business models evolving uh, but i do agree it has not picked up at the pace that we would have loved it to uh, second challenge not just the terrace side uh, consumers who are looking from an opex based perspective there is also this risk of collection of money right because you are getting paid either every month if it's not a rooftop basis if it's on an opex and it it may not be residential if you are looking specifically from an industrial perspective as well uh, there are very few companies who want to get into it because you are basically getting your revenues every month or quarter uh, and it becomes a challenge or it is not a sustainable model for 15 to 20 years so that that those are few of the challenges that i see so i like to add one more point on this so uh, why uh, people are not taking the interest on solar or maybe on rooftop so one is probably the demand and supply chain management if you see the installation of uh, thermal or solar or wind is very fast and we are almost more than 3.15 uh, lakh megawatt but the demand side management is very poor as per the ca uh, till 2027 there is no need to put any new power plant but if you consider the government new policy change in terms of electric vehicles so maybe by 2020 onwards maybe two couple of years in uh, maybe in future so the demand towards the evs will flourish and individual the, the cost of electricity is one side is dropping but to manage and sustain the 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 lcoe maybe it is rupees 5 rupees as on date but still it may fall less than 4 rupees for each and every individual will, that will, looks so attractive and have an electric car and having a 4 rupees per unit tariff at within your house. So that will give you a more attractive thing even without or without any incentive from the government. So that may happen maybe in a couple of years. Um, we'll add one point. Basically see, uh, in the residential area or uh, in the rural area, it will take time to penetrate because it is an economic and commercial decision. And India's tariff is skewed because these uh, residential and rural area, rural area are compensated by the industry. So if somebody is getting first hundred unit as two rupees or two point five rupees, why he will put the solar? Even he have the roof also. So unless otherwise, like uh, what the many people are saying. Uh, in the industry that it should be like a one tariff for all and if it will come then uh, you will find it make more sense because unless otherwise economics thing will not go fast uh, hello my question is to mr reddy uh, it is first of all thank you that you have brought uh, the concept of central versus string inverter so uh, my question to you that what is the maximum capacity can what is the hand? maximum capacity uh, do you think we can go ahead with a string inverter uh, presently we have 100 volts uh, that is 43 kV kilowatt wala inverter with us string inverter and i think double the capacity huawei is recently launched uh, if you were aware of the i was in one of the exhibitions now at uh, greater noida of twice the capacity so uh, no, sorry, sorry. Uh, my uh, maybe I not made it clear. What is the maximum project size you are uh, thinking we can go ahead with a string inverter? <laughs> because it is beneficial yes. as compared than the central inverter. Yeah, in all our future plans as a policy matter, we are uh, uh, accepted that we will go ahead with the string inverter. So it could be uh, even in Kamuti like plant. In future, we would like to go ahead with the string inverters. So that is 648 megawatt. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, we won't have time for more no. questions. And uh, just uh, a second, I in the interest of time. Okay, we can take last. one last question. So I need to ask uh, to uh, Matsudan sir, you are using this uh, robot cleaning. So whether you are using at both of your location uh, in Rajasthan and South also. So 
do you think that robot cleaning is uh, useful with different part of the country because soil level and the uh, dust type is different if we compare Rajasthan or the southern region so right. so I uh, uh, given an example on Rajasthan so the, the initial estimate of soil loss is 3 percent so once you use this robot kind of uh, technology that soil loss will be approximately 0.3 percent so approximately it is the gain of 2.7 percent so if you do not use a robot system even in south india where you don't have much of soiling loss but maybe it may, it may be a minimum one percent if you clean every 15 days so still you will be in a better uh, gain and moreover you will not require much manpower and daily cleaning and everything is automatized so that's a good deal and it's not much difference in the in terms of capex Okay, so moving on, uh, I would like to sincerely thank our uh, distinguished speakers on the dice for uh, putting a real uh, sincere thought and sharing their uh, views. Uh, I think it was very, very enlightening for all of us in the morning, uh, especially when we all wake up, uh, woke up today hearing about uh, the news about uh, tariffs in US imposed 30% on all imports in US. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause uh, for distinguished speakers on the guys. I would like to move on now and uh, would like to request Ma'am Monica Marathi to uh, present a small uh, token of uh, gifts and uh, mementos to all the uh, sp distinguished speakers on the dais, please. Okay, so on request of Monica, ma'am, I'll request uh, Mr. Keshav Prasad to present the mementos. Thank you.